Hey everybody, welcome back to History Student Reacts. I'm trying out a new shortened introduction today, so let's jump right into Hannibal Part 6, Battle of Lake Trasimene by History March. The defeat at Trebia struck fear into the Roman leadership. Mm. Yeah, we saw Trebia was a great victory for Hannibal, and a rather humiliating defeat for the Romans, and not only was it humiliating, but as History March are pointing out, it really did strike fear into their hearts. Now, Hannibal was on Roman land. He was in Roman territory, Cisalpine Gaul. Of course, Rome hadn't controlled Cisalpine Gaul for that long, but still, he's moving into the Italian peninsula. He's now had a couple of pretty impressive victories against the Romans, and he appears to still be going. If you're a Roman, even if you're, say, much farther south in Rome, you're gonna start getting pretty scared. The Republic lost all control over Cisalpine Gaul. Hannibal succeeded in bringing the Gauls to his side, nearly doubling his army. Yep. 40,000 infantry and 10,000 cavalry are now under his command. And so now a massive part of Hannibal's army is made up of Gallic auxiliaries or Gallic soldiers whatever you want to refer to them as. And of course, as I mentioned, Cisalpine Gaul hadn't been controlled that long f by the Romans, and so many of the Gauls there had not been completely brought to heel by Roman power. They were still looking for a way to revolt and rebel, and Hannibal basically gave them that option, and now we can see Hannibal's army is swelling to a much bigger size. I mean, consider his crossing through the Alps. He lost a lot of men, a lot of resources, his army emerged certainly hardened and disciplined, but also a lot smaller. Now he's sort of solving that problem. The march south continues. Hmm, Battle of Lake Trasimene. And we've covered this before in a Historia Civilis reaction, a members only Historia Civilis reaction. Uh, you can check that out, I'll leave it in the top right corner if you want to see it but we're going to be getting a little more detail this time and seeing the battle in context. Faced with the Gallic uprising in Cisalpine Gaul and still shocked by the loss of tens of thousands of troops at the River Trebia, the mm. Roman Senate is determined to turn things around in 217 BC. Amidst the political Kenshin turmoil, two well, new hello? consuls are elected and sent north. Uh, must have just been like an editing error or something. <laughs> north against Hannibal with newly raised armies. Other theaters of war are not ignored, evident by the victory against the Carthaginians at the Ebro and the planned reinforcements set for Iberia later yeah. in the year. And we covered this last time, of course. Hannibal is striking fear into the heart of Rome. Uh, you know, back in Italy, but it's not all bad for the Romans. We saw the Battle of the Ebro River was a success, a naval success for the Romans against the Carthaginians. So it's not like it's all bad for Rome, but it's still a pretty dangerous situation. But the main focus of the Roman war effort is on home soil. The plan is to use the geography of the Italian peninsula to their advantage. With the vast marshlands of the Arno River in the west, thought to be impassable during winter and spring due to flooding, and the rugged Apennine mountain range cutting across the peninsula, mm. the Romans know that there are only two routes into central Italy that Hannibal can take, and they move to block both. Consul Gaius Flaminius positions his army at Aretium, including the 10,000 legionnaires that survived the Battle of Trebia. Wow. His co-consul, Gnaeus Servilius Geminus, is stationed at Ariminum. Both armies are bolstered with a higher number of horsemen than usual, perhaps okay. to offset their numerical inferiority in cavalry. Yeah, and that is pretty unusual for the Romans, as we've covered, usually far more focused on infantry than cavalry. So we see them bulking up their cavalry a little bit here. Uh, we also see the introduction of a couple of new characters, for once, not part of a Scipio family. <laughs> you know, we've already seen a lot of Scipios, and we will see more in the future, of course. Hannibal, meanwhile, has problems of his own. 
While he did establish a base of operations in the Po Valley, Gallic support will weaken over time as his army continues to consume their resources. Right. At the same time... Yeah, it's worth remembering, a lot of the Gauls are turning to Hannibal because they've been subjugated by Rome, and Hannibal presents another option. He presents a way to fight back. But Hannibal is also a foreign conqueror. And the longer he remains in the area, the more resources he takes, the more that would likely become evident. So if Hannibal wants to keep the level of support he has right now, he sort of has to keep things moving, right? Time, the Romans decided not to pursue further battles in the north, so staying there makes little sense for Hannibal. Mm. He needs to put pressure on the Romans before his Gallic allies lose interest in the war. All right. Just like the Senate, Hannibal knows that he can either go down the Adriatic coast and fight Servilius in the rugged terrain of Picenum, or he can fight Flaminius in the difficult Apennine mountain passes. Neither route is good. Mm. Whichever he chose, not only would the Romans be alerted about his movement ahead of time, but he would be forced into a prolonged and uncertain battle against the well-defended Roman positions. Right. Which would allow time for the two consular armies to link up. Something that Hannibal can ill afford. That's true, and it is kind of interesting that they chose to separate in the first place. Now, they've done this to guard both of the passages south, but it does still present a risk to the Romans. Their armies are once again separated, whereas Hannibal, he has one united force. This has certainly been a strength of Hannibal so far. And like I said, you understand why the Roman armies are broken up. First off, as we can see, this is how they do things to different leaders but also to block these two passages. Still, there's pros and cons. But with the arrival of warm spring weather, the Carthaginian general does the unexpected. He decides to force march his army across the Apennine Mountains and through the dangerous marshlands of the Arno River. He loves aiming to marching through the mountains. Consuls and get into a good position to threaten Rome itself. Mm. The plan is arguably just as audacious as was the crossing of the Alps. <laughs> the march is extremely difficult. Hannibal places his most disciplined infantry, the hard-marching Libyans and Iberians, at the head of the column. Yeah, once again, the guys who have been with him through everything. The Libyans and the Iberians. Obviously, Carthage is primarily um, based in North Africa, right? So that, that's the Libyans. And Hannibal, his family is based in Iberia. His father did a lot of conquering there. So we have the troops that are from his home territories that have stuck with him, and he continues to have them at the front. I imagine these are the most disciplined, strong, and loyal troops of the entire army. And now we have basically another difficult march through the mountains. Stuff like this can be easy to overlook. We like to focus on the battles, those sort of big events. But actions like this are incredibly important. What they signify, how they affect Hannibal's army. We saw he took a bit of a blow from the march through the Alps. It was pretty difficult. But also the strategy of the whole thing. The advantages it gives Hannibal. This is equally as important. This sort of maneuvering as a lot of the battles we're going to see. They set a fast pace, which the Gauls find difficult to maintain as they are not used to forced marches. Mm. And by being at the back of the column, they face the added difficulty of having to march through the sticky quagmire that has been churned up by the troops in front of them. Right. The cavalry is in the rear of the column, ushering the Gauls forward and keeping an eye on any who <laughs> might decide to turn back. Yeah, I mean, obviously that's a conscious choice. <laughs> cavalry at the back... So, if the Gauls think, you know, maybe I just want to head home. I'm not so interested in marching anymore. Well, they're going to have to go through the Carthaginian cavalry. And I reckon they'd rather not do that, so they keep moving forward. <laughs> the terrain, however, is the army's biggest enemy. The Arno River flooded after winter rains, turning the river basin into heavily flooded, muddy wetlands. The endless, dense swampland offers almost no dry areas for resting. Mm. Hannibal's troops wade through deep pools of water for four days and three nights, Jesus. with almost no sleep and no rest, whilst carrying their heavy equipment and supplies. 
Yeah, and I think this is also sort of a famous moment from Hannibal's career, you know, marching through these swamps. I think this is probably more well-known than the march through the mountains that immediately preceded it. This is a rather iconic image of this war. Those fortunate enough to be mounted are able to sleep in their saddles, while a handful of those on foot manage to climb onto the bodies of dead horses yeah. and pack animals. Well, you can probably see why it's so well known. It's such an extreme and difficult situation. For a brief rest. Many die to infection, disease, exhaustion, and drowning. Yep. Abel himself catches an mm -hmm. eye infection, which cannot be treated because there is no time to stop the column during the forced march, and he carries the infection for much of the journey, eventually losing sight in one eye. Yep. Um, this is probably another reason why this moment is so well known, is because Hannibal loses something himself. You know, infection in his eye caused by these terrible circumstances and he loses sight in one of his eyes so you know look it's not just the soldiers that are going through it absolutely anybody who is there including Hannibal is really braving themselves through this situation putting their body to a, the test he emerges from the swamp on the back of his sole surviving elephant probably the brave Syrian Right. All the while, the Romans assumed that Hannibal is contained in the north. But what they didn't know is that the Carthaginian general managed to cross the Apennine Mountains and the Arno River wetlands <laughs> with 50,000 troops in just four days. Whoa. All without being detected. And is now in position for the next stage of his campaign. That is incredible. And once again, we really see the m mobility, the maneuverability that Hannibal's army brings to this fight, undetected moving that many men in such a short amount of time. That's an incredibly impressive feat. Like I said, just as impressive as some of the battles we've seen and are going to see throughout this series. And stuff like this, as we've seen before, can really give you an upper hand. And Hannibal absolutely takes advantage of that. He grants his army a few days to rest and sends scouting parties south. He learns that Flaminius is at Aretium, and that the Etrurian plain can offer enough food and plunder to boost the morale of the troops. Having learned that Flaminius is an arrogant and rash commander, hmm. he plans to provoke him into giving battle by pillaging and burning the rich Etrurian countryside. Soon enough, plumes of smoke from burning villages and fields dot the land west of Aretium followed by the Carthaginian column passing right next to Flaminius, brazenly taunting the Roman general. Yep. Watching from Aretium, Flaminius is fuming, mm. knowing that it is he who is supposed to protect these lands. Fantastic. We see another trait, which we've identified Hannibal has in spades, which is an ability to read his opponent, right? We've seen this before. We're seeing it again. Hannibal knows exactly what to do to provoke his enemy or force his enemy to act in one way or another. Just very intelligent strategy here. He's playing mind games with them. <laughs> and yet one of the richest areas in Italy is burning on his watch. But he somehow resists challenging the Carthaginian general. Okay. Persuaded by his advisors to stay put and wait <laughs> until Servilius joins him. Smart, very smart. Unable to force an open battle, for Hannibal, an assault on Aretium is out of the question. Mm. He cannot risk losing too many of his experienced soldiers that he cannot replace. His army also has limited supplies and has to keep moving. Furthermore, Hannibal has no way of knowing how far the other Roman army is. And as far as he knows, Servilius could be arriving any day now. So the Carthaginian general decides to press on. Leaving not one, but two armies in his rear must have dangerous. seemed mad. But yep, I mean, that's an incredibly dangerous move to make. You're really leaving yourself vulnerable. But we've seen what Hannibal is capable of. Also, he's kind of lacking information. He doesn't have much of a choice. At least he feels like he doesn't have much of a choice. He has to keep going. Not to mention... If I would trust anybody to deal with this situation, it would be Hannibal. 
We've seen his quick thinking, the maneuverability of his army, how quickly he can get them into position, move them around, these sneaky marches that his enemies don't know about. If there's anybody who can handle this sort of situation, it's our man Hannibal Barca. Actually, by bypassing Aretium, Hannibal maintains the initiative and keeps the Romans guessing. He wants to be the one who dictates the course of the campaign. Mm. But scouts soon bring good news. Flaminius decided not to wait for Servilius after all. Knowing that the battle is soon coming, Hannibal makes sure to let his Gallic troops know that they will be fighting against Flaminius, the man who caused them much misery in years past. Ah, uh, okay. Flaminius is renowned for his victories against Gallic tribes. He is responsible for introducing a law that allowed Romans to settle near and on Gallic lands. This created conflict, which Flaminius resolved by invading and occupying more Gallic lands. All right, so we, you know, have our pretty typical Roman conqueror here, and unsurprisingly, the Gauls hold a bit of a personal grudge. I mean, look, you can't really blame them, right? Rome is expanding into their territory, and this appears to be one of the main guys responsible for that. Uh, also someone who was pretty successful at expanding into Gallic territory. So, that's another advantage for Hannibal. His Gallic troops, who may be maybe less loyal <laughs> than some of his Carthaginian troops, they haven't been with him for that long, he just forced marched them through probably one of the worst situations of their entire lives. If they didn't already, now they do have a reason to really fight, you know, something that is meaningful to them and then proceeded to settle more Romans on the lands he conquered. Needless to say, he is hated by the Gauls, and the 17,000 of them in Hannibal's army can't wait to get their hands on yep, him. Yup, there you go. Meanwhile, for the Roman army that prides itself on its military prowess, it must be humiliating to pass through villages and countryside. Mm. Well, I mean, yeah, Rome's getting treated like it usually treats other people. <laughs> you know, Rome loves going, marching around in hostile territory, burning down towns, um, fighting enemy armies, absolutely dominating, you know. And now they're getting treated like they're some sort of barbarians. Hannibal's marching through their territory, humiliating them, burning down their towns, killing people. You know, I'm sure this must be incredibly frustrating for the Romans. Uh, frustration that, as we mentioned earlier, sort of verges on fear as Hannibal gets closer and closer to Rome and as he wins more and more battles. But Flaminius can still redeem himself, and he is only one day's march away. It's early morning of June 24th, 217 BC. Mm. Flaminius marches out of his camp towards the smoke rising in the distance, apparently from Carthaginian campfires, eager to get to grips with the enemy. In the front, he places veteran legionnaires that survived the Battle of Trebia, mm. who were also very keen on meeting the enemy in battle. Oh, yeah. As the column moves, a low hanging mist envelops the lake and the valley. The yeah, these seem like favorable conditions for Hannibal, <laughs> a man who is known for the mobility of his forces, his ability to conduct these sort of secret marches, uh, hide out and surprise his enemies. Uh, I got to imagine that this would be beneficial for Hannibal. The shoreline is eerily quiet. The locals seem to have vanished. Mm. Unable to see too far ahead, the Romans literally stumble into Hannibal's heavy infantry, who are blocking the road. Oh. Fighting spontaneously erupts at the far end of the valley. Despite being surprised by the enemy, the Roman vanguard forms up in battle formation. Yeah. Uh, like I said, this was beneficial for Hannibal. The Romans have been surprised. They've happened upon Hannibal's infantry. But, once again, and I will and have reiterated this time and time again, the Roman infantry is one of the best infantry forces in the world, probably in history. I mean, an incredibly well-disciplined, heavy infantry. So, regardless of the situation they're in, 
they're usually pretty damn good at forming up, holding the line, and even pushing back. Um, regardless if they've, you know, planned to fight on favorable territory, or it's a situation like this where they've been surprised, uh, I would usually give it to the Romans. Uh, except they're fighting against Hannibal, so I'm sure he has a trick or two up his sleeve. Further back, it is some time before the Roman center and rear realize what is happening in the front. The visibility is hampered by the low-hanging morning mist. Mm. But in the hills above the mist, Hannibal's hidden yep. troops can clearly see the Roman oh. column. There you go. I'll of course, you knew Hannibal had something waiting. He had some troops hidden somewhere. He was ready to pounce. We've seen him do it several times before. And in some ways, he's just using the same trick over and over again. But when it's effective, well executed, and pretty intelligent, you know, keep doing it, right? Uh, and it's not like this is an automatic win. Like I said, you have to execute this sort of thing well every time. And, you know, think about the time period, communications. It's rather difficult to communicate your orders to a large army at this point in time. And so to set something up like this with all the fog, hiding your infantry down on the road, and then setting the rest of your soldiers up atop the hills, and then getting them to attack on your command, this is difficult to execute. And Hannibal keeps doing it successfully. An absolute credit to him, his leadership, and the discipline of his troops. Although they do not know it yet, the Romans walked straight into an ambush. Yep. But let's take a moment to consider how difficult it was to set up the ambush at... I, I didn't have to make the point. <laughs> this three march is making the point for me, so I'll let them explain it. How difficult this would be to do. Lake Trasimene. Hannibal couldn't just send his troops up the hill to their positions. That would have left tracks all over the hillside. Mm. And with Flaminius hot on his heels, he didn't have much time either. Yet Hannibal marched to the eastern end of the valley and somehow managed to coordinate tens of thousands of troops around the hills to the north into their Incredible. correct positions. At night, all within a brief window of time and without arousing any suspicion. I mean, we just see that speed, stealth, and decisiveness which we constantly see from Hannibal. Um, I mean, you know, I'm familiar with Hannibal and his exploits, and we've already seen very impressive feats from him, but I find myself continually impressed with how he responds to these situations. I really do. This is without doubt quite an astonishing military <laughs> feat. Yeah. Now, Hannibal signals his hidden forces to attack. It's unclear if trumpets signaled the start of the attack, or if his captains were ordered to wait until the Romans are deep enough in the valley. Mm. Whatever the case, the ambush succeeds completely. The use of campfires in the distance tricked the Romans into moving deep into the valley, thinking mm. that the Carthaginians are further ahead. And by masterfully hiding tens of thousands of his troops in the hills, Hannibal completely surrounded the enemy. And we can just see each Roman army that Hannibal comes up against, they're just not prepared. They're not ready to face him. They are not thinking outside the box. They see Hannibal or, you know, some sign of Hannibal's army, and they just go straight for it. Whether it's, you know, they're not thinking of all the possibilities or, you know, probably some element of Roman ego. Rome sees itself as the greatest fighting civilization, they think they absolutely should be able to beat Hannibal. They head right in there, and every time he has something else going on that the Romans don't expect. And it leads to situations like these. Coming seemingly out of nowhere, Numidian cavalry and Gallic heavy infantry engage the Roman rear, closing mm. off their line of retreat. Hannibal's light infantry, skirmishers, and Gallic heavy infantry clash with the Roman center. Having previously marched in a very loose formation, Flaminius's army is caught completely by surprise. Uh-oh. They soon find themselves in a fight for their life. Their formations break up, and many soldiers are left to fend for themselves. Yeah, and I, I talked about how well-disciplined and well-trained the Roman infantry was, and that is true, but... 
even the Romans in a situation like this where they've been completely surprised, not to mention they're sandwiched in between Hannibal's men and this lake, man, they are pretty much done for. Um, of course, many of them are still well-disciplined and strong fighters. They're going to try and fight back, save their lives, but they are in a disastrous situation. The fighting is so fierce that none of the combatants notice a strong nearby earthquake. Wow. After less than an hour of fighting, Hannibal's troops split apart the disorganized enemy column. Mm. From this point on, the battle becomes a slaughter. Yeah. Numidians and Gauls overwhelm the Roman rear, forcing them all the way to the lakeshore. Many try to swim in their heavy armor, mm. desperate to get away. According to Polybius, many Romans drown in the lake, while others who manage to stay afloat beg for mercy. But yeah, it's always a pretty tragic thing to see men weighed down with heavy armor or weapons so desperate to save their lives that they try and jump in a body of water, try to swim away, and of course, inevitably, it's not going to work. They're not thinking straight. They're absolutely desperate. And to be fair, you know, what's their other option? Fight against the Carthaginians and be killed by them, right? So uh, it's, a, it's a difficult situation. And, you know, I, I imagine if you were an observer of this battle, it would be a pretty, you know, tragic thing to witness. But are killed then and there. The Roman center fights a brave last stand, but after another two hours of fighting, most of Flaminius's men are cut down, while others drown in the lake as they try to swim away. Damn. According to legend, the Roman consul is recognized amidst the fighting, and the enraged Gauls fight to get to him. Wow. <laughs> the consul's best troops rally to protect him, but one of the Gallic warriors fights his way through and thrusts his spear into the consul, killing him. Jeez, and I will say, there is absolutely a chance that that story is embellished. It's sort of a storybook situation. You know, the Gauls hold a personal grudge against this guy, and they finally get their opportunity to take revenge. So I wouldn't be surprised if it's a little embellished or over-exaggerated, but this is one of those situations that could absolutely have happened. Like, you could definitely imagine that going down, some Gallic warriors surging forward, to take out someone who they hated so much. But, you know, take a lot of these stories you hear with a grain of salt, right? You Use appropriate, use appropriate skepticism, is what I'm saying. Meanwhile, the Roman vanguard still stands firm. Once they realize that the battle is lost, they start fighting their way through Hannibal's heavy infantry, desperate to escape the field. Mm. But they too would be captured within a day or two after the battle. In less than three hours of fighting, a whole Roman army is virtually wiped out. Oh my god. It is said that Flaminius's body was torn to pieces by Gallic soldiers, <laughs> so much so that Hannibal was not able to find any trace of the consul after the battle to Jesus. give him a proper burial. Carthaginian losses, meanwhile, are minor. La wow. Look at that discrepancy. The Romans, 15,000 dead. And 15,000 captured, not to mention they've lost a consul. Uh, these guys are dropping like flies, huh? <laughs> and then look at the Carthaginians. We have 1,500 to 2,500 dead. That is an incredible victory for Hannibal. Large plunder is taken, especially military equipment. Hannibal re-equips his Libyan infantry. Each man is given a Roman mail, bronze helmet, and an oval scutum shield. Huh, wow. Within a few days, the Romans suffer another disastrous loss. Yep. As Servilius was on the move to join Flaminius, he hurriedly sent all of his 4,000 cavalry ahead of the army to help his co-consul. Okay. Hannibal learned of their movement even before Servilius knew about Flaminius's defeat. Oh, no. I'm telling you, these Romans have to stick together. Stop separating. <laughs> Does not work out well for them. Harbal, Hannibal's second in command, rode out to meet them launching a surprise attack. Those who survived were captured. Mm. By eliminating Servilius's cavalry, Hannibal effectively neutralized his entire consular army. Oh yeah. Few now the mobility of his army is way down. It's going to be a lot harder 
to fight, say, rear guard actions or send the cavalry out to skirmish. He doesn't have his intelligence anymore. Of course, uh, cavalry would also serve as scouts. Hannibal has just chopped off an extremely important limb of this remaining Roman army. Few, if any, commanders have been able to match Hannibal's ambush at Lake Trasimene, where one entire army ambushed and effectively destroyed another entire army. Hmm. The population in Rome fell into utter despair, <laughs> as Lake yeah. Trasimene is not far, and it seems like there is nothing that can stop Hannibal from attacking the city. Yeah. As Servilius has to withdraw back to Ariminum to counter the Gauls, who, encouraged by Hannibal's presence, aggressively began raiding Roman territory. Uh-oh. In this time of crisis, the Senate appoints a dictator, a certain Fabius Maximus, to coordinate the defense against Hannibal. And keep in mind, I mentioned this before in our Roman history reactions, but it feels worthwhile mentioning it again. Dictator, as we've just covered, was an appointed position. Uh, it had rules to it. It gave one individual an incredible amount of power, but the idea is that they would wield that power to defend the Republic and then lay down their arms, you know, uh, relinquish the power that they had been granted. And... Most of the time, that actually worked. Dictator didn't have such a negative connotation at this point. So I know when you hear that, it might sound bad to us, but it's not necessarily as bad as it sounds. And the position of dictator is a little more controlled than you might expect, or maybe a little bit more held back, at least in the fact that the people who took this position would usually serve out their dictatorship, um, do whatever extraordinary action they had to do to save the Republic, and then, you know, relinquish the power. Um. Meanwhile, Hannibal makes preparations to press on further into Italy. Oh my. Uh, so that is the end of part six, and on the dictatorship, of course. Um, you know, we see a lot of authoritarianism later on in the Republic as Roman institutions start to crumble. <laughs> so... Uh, don't worry, a lot of authoritarianism will come, but there are examples of people being given this position and actually not abusing it, or not abusing it too badly. <laughs> um, so yeah, that was part six, Battle of Lake Trasimene, another incredible victory from Hannibal. Uh, of course, we haven't even gotten to his most impressive victory, which I, you know, we will see down the line at some point. Um, can I, of course, but we've already seen a bunch of incredible victories from Hannibal. His campaign is going absolutely swimmingly, and the Romans are in a lot of trouble. Will they be able to get themselves out of it? Well, we know. <laughs> we know how the war ends up, but they won't be able to get themselves out of it for quite a while. We've still got a lot of Hannibal's victories to go through in this series, so I've been having a good time with this series. If you guys enjoyed this one, I'd appreciate it if you would check out the Patreon, which is linked down below. You can get exclusive reactions, including full unedited reactions that I can't upload to YouTube because of copyright reasons. I'd also appreciate it if you would leave a like, subscribe, leave a comment, you know, all of that good stuff. Now, with that out of the way, I hope you guys are all having a good day today, and I will see you all again next time. Goodbye.